So welcome everybody. And once again, now that we're recording, thank you very much for kind of joining us. And the topic for tonight, the takeaway that I want all of you guys to get from tonight's little 10 minute discussion, and then we'll answer questions that you guys all have and we'll keep the recording going, is the more you do, the greater volume of work that you do, the greater your fitness and the greater your fitness the faster you will be on race day, okay? That's really the takeaway. If you wanted to just hang up right now, if you got that, that's really the takeaway. Everything else I say after this is going to prove that statement and show you how you can do it. Um, if you have been doing LA Roadrunner schedules last couple of years and you want to increase right. your fitness and be better off on race day, all you need to do is add five minutes here, five minutes there to your midweek workouts. And bam, you will be a little bit better on LA Marathon race day. You'll have your PR. That's how this whole deal works. Um, the, it's not about building to a 20 mile run. That's pretty much worthless. And in some ways I could argue destructive, truthfully. Um, we'll discuss that in a minute. Um, but it's the total volume that you do. Let's take a look at something. I'm going to share my screen right now um, really, really quick. Whoop. Uh, here we go. And hopefully, whoops. How did that happen? Wait a minute. Uh, hang on one sec. Let me share my screen. Why is this not working? There we go. And let's share the screen if I can find the right one. Hang on, sorry. No, for some dumb reason, I'm not finding it. Uh, here we go. Um, sorry, you guys. Here we go. Oh, it's my purpose coming on. Sorry about this. Here we go. Okay, now I can share my screen. For some reason, I don't know why that program wasn't coming up. Uh, here we go, good. There you go. So you could probably now see my screen, I am hoping. Um, this is a schedule for group five. Let me move this a little out of the way. This is a schedule for group five. And you can see this is the first week, September 19th. That's where we began. Each segment, you'll note there are six, roughly six segments, six phases of our schedule. And um, I just happened to grab this group five schedule. I didn't really matter which schedule, but um, they're all pretty similar. Um, so here's the first four weeks, and you'll note the fourth week down here is five miles. This whole entire week is a taper week. This is only 30 minutes, where this is probably about 50 minutes um, the week before I'm talking about. This is only three sets of three minutes. Well, that's similar, but we also have a T-pace five minutes thrown in there and some other time. Um, 45 minutes, we're a day off. So this is clearly a cutback week from the week previous. So we have three weeks build, one week taper, and then uh, this past month, three week build, one week taper, we went from nine miles, we went to down to five miles, and these were all much shorter. You can see here, uh, we went from increase of about 8.3% increase to 44 point, I think, what is that, 8% decrease. So this whole week here was over 44% less volume to give you a time to recover. Now, here we are in our current, whoops, here we go. Uh, our current week is this week here. We're now increasing 8% over the previous build week. That's this week here. We're now 8% over that. And we got two more weeks and then we got another taper week. After this taper week, we will be halfway through training. So the point being is the time is now 
Not only do we benefit from more volume, but the time is now to really focus on getting all of these midweek runs and run walks and walks. Um, we're all human, we all have the same physiology, run, run, walk, or walk. Um, get them in. Because again, the more, the greater the fitness you do, or the greater the volume you do, the greater the fitness you get, the greater the fitness, the faster you'll be able to, or the easier you'll be able to go on your marathon race day. So um, we're almost, you know, that's Saturday is right here, 10 miles. We are in the double digits right there. You can see my cursor. Um, two weeks later, we're, we're in our taper week. Got it? So this is the end of week nine, 10, 11, and then there's 12 is our taper week. And after that, we are halfway through our training season. So there are different phases that they are called in training. One, you know, where you're beginning way back here, you know, you're calling this, we'll call this like pre-preparation phase, right? And then, uh, you know, this next second month was probably more pre-preparation. And now we're like in preparation phase. Preparation meaning preparation for the race, right? It's coming up. Um, so after this week here, the mid-December, December 5th through the 11th, um, now we're really into preparation phase because after these four weeks, after this next phase that's coming up, you got to race the first week. That's a half marathon. So we got this, the three weeks left of this phase and then all of the next phase and right away, bam, you got a half marathon. And now you're going from pre-competition or pre-comp phase right into competition phase. And you got a taper right after that. Look, at you, you got almost 40% decrease after your 51% decrease over this build week here. So you're going from like 16 miles in this entire week, which is like 41 miles total, 41 miles total the week of December 26th through January 1st. And oh yes, we are gonna be active on holidays. We will be there. Years past, you know, we went dark. There ain't no going dark in the LA Roadrunners during holidays this year. I will be there. Um, but so you still got another taper week after that, and you only have a 1% increase after that. So you are really in competition mode. You are really not building more than 1% in that three weeks of that fifth phase of training. And then you got an 8% build at the very, very end there. And then you continue on. But then you only have three more weeks of build. And then bammo, you're tapering for the LA Marathon. So yeah, bammo is right. So you're really looking at about two and a half, two, really two and three quarters months of training here, more or less. And you're in the LA Marathon. I'm talking about building. So let me show you something else. Excuse me. Uh, let me show you one other little item. And this one I just saw a second ago. Here we go. This will should pop right up. There we go. And get rid of that. And here we go. Whoops. Why am I... Anyway, um, what you're looking at, this little screen right here, is a, a diagram, a very common diagram for coaches. It basically, I wish I could pull up the whole thing and somehow I'm not. Um, it, it really has to do, you're seeing this green thing, I think, I believe. Let's see. Uh, yeah, you should be seeing this. Let me make sure. Here we go. So here we go. There we are. So you should be seeing this green thing in front of you. And uh, basically what it has to do with is again, building in seasons and phases of training. Um, from the beginning, this wide start of your kind of sort of almost triangle, um, you're doing a lot more general training. You could do 
strength training. Well, that's a bad example. You could play tennis, you could go swimming, you could play soccer. You know, that's all of those things are general training. And if you did, you could do yoga. If you did swap out some of those training workouts for that general training, riding your bike, playing tennis, playing golf, whatever it is, um, you want to start tapering that down as this diagram shows. And specific training is really running or run walking or walking. What you're doing on race day is real specific training. What you're doing in training for that specific event, LA Marathon or Rose Bowl Half, is kind of specific training. Um, so you want to do a little less specific training. You saw we had less volume of run, run, walk, or walk. And you want to now build more and more of that and taper down on less and less general training. Now, now you can maintain strength training. You may not want to do quite as much because you may not have as much time to do as much strength training as you know running or run walking or walking, whatever your regimen. But um, that that's just a graphic example of really what to start thinking about. Less general training, less playing tennis or bowling or whatever you're doing, and more specific training, run, run, walk, or walk. Got it? With a little strength training still thrown in there. And let's get in, get rid of that. So that is, is part, that is really the key of what I wanted to talk about this evening. Um, let me spotlight my, there you go. You can kind of see me a little better now. Um, that's really the key of what I wanted to talk about this evening. I'm, I'm only going to add one little thing to this. And that's that, you know, why do we do these 20 mile runs? Why do we do these long weekend runs? If you could really do, you know, morning, evening, morning, evening, spread it out the whole week, um, that would be wonderful. My qu and you wouldn't have to do a 20 mile run. The, but it, it goes to the point of volume. The greater the volume you do, the greater fitness you will have. And I've spoken to this before. If you, how many of us, you could get rid of that 20 mile run. You could knock that 20 mile run down to 12 miles, 13 miles. You'd still do great. It has nothing to do with a 20 mile run. I know we all think that this is the end all be all. I've done my 20 mile run. I've built up to that. Now I can do a marathon. That is absolutely worthless thinking. It has nothing to do with reality. What it has to do with is the greater the volume you do overall, not one day, not one run, but the entire week, the entire season. If you can add up all of those workouts, um, as we do here, I mean, look at this end total, group five. I don't know if you can see this. Um, you're, you're looking at the schedule again, but um, on this schedule, you will note the very bottom of the schedule it has totals. Look at that. The entire season, easy pace. Group five is going 450 miles, 0.89 miles, easy pace. They're going 686.44 total miles um, with approximately 80% aerobic and 20% anaerobic. That's the whole season mapped out right there in that little box right there. That's what, what's important. Your, your 686.44 miles that's what's important. Your 20 mile run is worthless. Now, why do we do a 20 mile run? Well, the question is, is if you cut down the 20 mile run, you still need the volume during the midweek, right? So sure, you could do 12 miles on Saturday instead of 20 for that peak week, but you'd have to take eight miles and spread that out through the entire week. And you could do that, you know, you could generally do that um, or, and even add more miles to it. But, you know, the reality is eight more miles, you know, how many of us have time to do like an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening, or maybe an hour and a half in the morning and an hour in the evening or whatever it is. I mean, we just, we non-pro athletes don't have time to do that. So we tend to load it all onto this long Saturday workout. And one of the reasons that 
I like these shorter, you know, out back, out back, out back kind of runs is, yeah, if you do get injured, you're, you're much closer to home. We don't have to drive 10 miles away to pick you up. But the other flip side of the coin is it does give one the ability to just go out and back, not out, back, out, back, out, back, you know, and do these longer, longer runs. You could do a shorter run, which helps those people who are just starting so they don't have to do a long, long run. They could only do a portion of it. Or if you had the ability to chop down that Saturday run and shove it into the midweek, you'd have less risk of injury and you'd have probably better fitness because you would recover more. You wouldn't have this long, long run that takes more time to recover from, which is actually disadvantageous that we train the way we do. But we have to because we don't have the time midweek. So this was the one where I really wanted to hammer home that idea of more volume. We're getting there. You really need to start thinking of the future. We humans sadly don't think to the future enough. And looking at that schedule, you know, it's coming. It's coming really fast. There's all three of those weeks is finer ta final taper. They're all taper in those green weeks. Here are three weeks of build peak week and now you're getting into you know all three of the weeks are taper week and you only got your build week here at mile 18. Um, this is only one percent increase even though we have a 17 miler um, so that's coming up and then you only got this this phase these four week phase and the one we're on now that's it the one we're on now and the one after it, those two phases, and then the three weeks beyond that, we're pretty much good. We're we're getting in the in the in the races and stuff. So um, we'd actually be beyond races. We'd be into the 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 half marathon after this phase and the next phase. We're doing our half marathon. So really, time now to start thinking about getting all those midweek workouts in. And um, that is all I really wanted to talk about on my end. Does anyone have any questions about that? Hammering home, get in as, you know, there's no bad in endurance sport, but get in as many of those midweek miles as you possibly can. And Sunday, Sunday work as well. The more you do, the better you are. And it's going quick. I have a question. Yeah. Behind me, I have a question just started training do you think i still have time to run the marathon because i just healed my injury uh sure yeah but you won't be at a level of fitness like you normally will be you will be at a lower level of fitness meaning you'll have to go slower am i going to survive you will definitely survive as long as you take it a little slower at your current ability if level I'm doing 10 miles this weekend what do i run what was your last long run? Five. Uh, so go six. Okay. Thank there you, you go. Much. There you go. Um, a little homegrown coaching. <laughs> um, I see something in the chat. Uh, Tanya, thank you. Uh, I only saw schedules for a half marathon online. What if you started later in this program? You cannot do a long 10 mile run. Exactly. I think I just answered that one you know, go from where you are and add 10%. So like Julie was at five miles, if she could could actually go to six miles, which is a little more than 10%, but that, that's okay. Um, she's She's been running midweek fairly consistently. So adding one mile more to the weekend, adding up the entire week um, would not be that much more. By the way, you only saw the half marathon schedules online. Um, if you had you gone below where you were looking, let, let me show you, um, you'll see the full marathon schedules and um, go to here. I'll show you guys. Let me uh, wait a minute. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. I think if I can find the new thingy, here we go. Whoop. There we go. You're probably seeing this LA Marathon promo. So to find the schedules for all of you, you're probably seeing this, hopefully. 
Good. Okay. Um, for all of you uh, that are looking at the screen, go to Runner Info right there. Go down to LA Roadrunner Training Program, which you probably did before. You'll get LA Roadrunners here, pictures of us. Click on training up here and training plans. There we go. And you were probably there on this page before, LA Roadrunner Training Plans. And here, Rose Bowl Half Marathon. That's probably what you saw before. But if you keep going down farther, you will come to the Blue Marathon Training, LA Marathon. There you go. There are your LA Marathon training schedules. Um, your your um, it's level yeah. one through uh, level five. The coach, I clicked on that, and I also got like a half marathon. So if you click on that intensity, so I think I did. I clicked on level one and two okay. and. Uh, of the blue ones or the red ones? Yeah, the blue ones. Okay, well, let's see what pulls up. I'll show you. Here you go. It says download. Can you see this screen? Yes, I can see it. Great. It says LA Roadrunner, uh, LA Marathon Training Plan, level one, 5% intensity. Is that what you're looking at? Um, yeah, is it like 12 weeks, this? Or? Okay, here we go. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, 14. Here you go. Rose Bowl Half Marathon. You, you see that? The little blue square? Yeah. Got it. Okay. You go more. And there it is. LA Marathon Race Day. Oh, okay. So I clicked probably on something else then. You, you probably clicked on the blue level one schedule or the blue level two schedule, um, which is very common. This, uh, this is a question I've had before. But um, yeah, there you go. Um, go down to the blue schedules and the below the red ones. I, I'm guessing you probably clicked on level one or two or you know one of these because they they're both five percent, ten percent. They they kind of look the same except one's red, the half is red. Think red rose bowl yeah. and the blue one is of the marathon. So there you go, and they still say five percent, ten percent. They they kind of look similar. You know, but anyway, um, that, that hopefully that answered that one. Thank you. You are very welcome. Thank you for asking that question. Um, uh, Philip, what's the thought on days you miss, but then doubling up on days missed today, but running tomorrow and Saturday? Great, great, great question. Um, you don't want to do too much in any given day, right? If you look at what you did last week, you don't want to go, you know, way too much in a day more than that. So what you could do is, especially with easy work, if you miss like an easy, you know, if you miss in like, say, 60 minute easy pace on Thursday. OK, so just as a wild idea, uh, just throwing it out there. So you could take that 60 minutes you missed on Thursday and you could add it, not necessarily to Saturday because that's already a long run, but you could add 10 minutes to Sunday, 10 minutes to Monday of easy pace, right? You don't want to suddenly add, take 60 minutes easy pace and turn it into threshold runs here and there. Take 60 minutes of easy pace and add 10 minutes, you know, here or there. And you may not get the whole 60 minutes in, and that's okay. You know, I mean, it's not like, you know, any one of these runs is really going to destroy your season. You know what I'm saying? It's every one of these runs is a tiny fraction speck more toward your season. I mean, 600, what was it? 688 something miles, you know, going three miles in a, you know, one day routine or even say five miles of 680 something miles is hardly gonna you know put a huge dent in your schedule it's where you really start missing multiple days on and on and on but with the easy runs yeah you could divide up those easy runs you can't really do that with the threshold runs because they're kind of dependent upon high heart rate for a longer period of time so with the threshold runs if you have an easy say you miss wednesday and it's all threshold work or inter interval work, um, you could flip 
Wednesday with Thursday. So, right? So now you're doing your speed work, not Wednesday, but Thursday. But then you could take that Thursday 60 minutes and now spread that 60 minutes out, right? Does that make sense? It does. So <clears throat> like, for instance, like today I was going to do my 45 minutes easy and I did my threshold stuff, but, you know, life got in the way. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just do my 45 minutes tomorrow, Friday, but then I know I'm running the 10 on Saturday. So should I not do the 45 minutes tomorrow? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, be, be careful about not doing too much the day before a long run. Okay. Maybe you'd want to move it to Sunday. I okay. mean, moving it to Sunday might be a better choice. And okay. also maybe just do half of it, you know, half of what you missed on Sunday, you know, like whatever that is, like an extra 20 minutes or whatever it is. What was it like a 45 minute run or something you yeah, today, today was supposed to be a 45 minute run. I, yeah, I did so threshold. Maybe, got it. So maybe add 25 minutes to Sunday. As long as you feel good, you're not beaten up too much by Saturday. If right. you are, then just drop it. Because sometimes you don't want to risk injury. You, you, you know, th there is that balance. There's always that balance. And sometimes it's better off just uh, skipping it. And that's okay. You know, right. keep in mind, there is no bad in endurance sport things right. get in your way you get sick your children get sick you, you got a work thing you, you suddenly you got a, a longer dental appointment than you expected who knows what is going to happen in your life um life happens there's no bad in endurance sport the fact Thank you. That you will end up crossing a finish line on race day you know if you're five minutes slower or a minute slower or a few seconds slower who cares? You know, right. Um, right. you're still going to cross that finish line. Um, in the worst scenario, you may have to go to a slower group because you're not progressing as fast as your group because you're missing so much midweek or whatever. Um, but, you know, so you go to a slower group. How, how bad is that? You know, they're all pretty cool yeah. groups. No, no they're run great. With a lot of them. They're great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you. you know, I mean, they all tell the same bad jokes. I got to tell you. They... <laughs> I, I do have one more question I, and I don't want to monopolize it, but not at all. Um, last year I ran the half. Uh, it was my first time running a half. I ended up with a bit of a groin injury mm. and I realized later, I realized later. that it was um, a product of really just bad form, right? I was, I had like a cadence of 145 back then. Now I'm running at like a, 170 cadence much much right. faster you were kind of um, bounding it sounds like you were taking long strides. yes yes yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah and i ran it with the injury and anyways the, so you know i took like six weeks off the injury ran away but now i when i have whenever i do speed work because i'm i'm mm. doing the, the level three <laughs> program i'm trying to i'm trying to get faster mm -hmm. whenever i do the speed work i do find it starts to sting it goes away after a couple of, a couple of days, but it starts to sting. Like it never is fully a hundred percent gone. And I just, mm. I, you know, I don't know if it's like the iliopsoas sort of strengthening the hip store, you know, which I do, but just sort of what, what's the, cause you know, m one of my trainers is like, Hey man, you should just not do anything for two months, which is not an option for me. So, mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I um, just, I'm not a big fan of doing nothing. I mean, I would always say you could always run in water where you'd have no pounding at all if you have an indoor swimming pool somewhere with a little deep end kind of, um, you know, that would be better than doing nothing. Um, even just walking it out is better, you know, blood oxygen flow to heal the injury. The, the higher your heart rate goes, the quicker you'll heal. Um, you know, you might try, try creative things to get speed work in really what we're talking about is elevated heart rate. You're yeah. not really going to get elevated heart rate by running in water, but you'll be able to maintain your endurance. So you won't lose anything and you can heal that way. I mean, you know, running in water is a wonderful thing. I highly recommend it, but for what you're talking about, what you may want to do is try out different things that cause your form to change um, when you're doing speed work. 
And, you know, be careful that you're not you're reaching not way out with that leg on that speed work and it kind of essentially going way faster. Yeah. You know, your rhythm may be way quicker, but you may have the same form as what you did before by reaching way out with your leg, but you're just going so quick that the rhythm is faster. You know, right. your cadence is quicker. So be careful of that. But um, and, and we can take a look at your running form. And, and matter of fact, every week, the next few weeks, I'll have my little tablet out there. And um, anyway, um, I, I've been doing some pretty intriguing gait analysis, you know, filming people and then playing it back frame by frame and moving slowly. And, you know, you see the people moving and, you know, you can take a look at your form on video. And I'll be doing that free every week. Saturday after our workouts. Um, but um, you may want to try something like try because it's about heart rate. Threshold work is all about heart rate. It's nothing to do with speed, threshold with T pace. Okay. Yeah. Um, so try doing, and that's really the more important thing for building for a marathon, because you're talking about a long distance. And I won't go into how threshold pace benefits you, but really more than anything. Threshold pace is going to raise the bar on speed. It's not going to give you more endurance that you need from the slow stuff. That's why you got like 80% slow stuff, easy pace, and not 80% threshold work. But it will raise the bar so that you're faster on race day. So if you get your heart rate up there without this, you know, pounding on your groin and all, try running up a hill. You know, try short, quick steps going up a hill like a Malfi, you know, something yeah. in your neighborhood that's like that, where you can go for like 10 minutes up a hill or even two, three minutes up a hill. And then you can just like, you know, be gasping for air because you've just run yourself up a hill, but you weren't that fast because you're going up a hill. You're pushing yourself up that hill. Yeah. Um, you could do something I do all the time. Once a week, I run in sand short, quick stride in sand, you're pushing back. And it, you know, my pace drops like three to four minute per miles. And as soon as I get off that sand, my first step on concrete, I'm like speeding up just, and it feels the same, you know, but, but in terms of getting your heart rate way up there, you, you might consider running on sand, but again, really short, like the hill, short, quick stride, and that'll really raise your heart rate way up there without a pounding while going fast. Did right that on. make sense? Totally, totally. And what do you think about like spinning? I mean, I, I was a cyclist before I started long, long distance running, like in terms of like just raising heart rate, because this no impact, but I can definitely get it way up there. Well, if you can swim, I strongly recommend a triathlon. But that's another story, which we won't get into. Um, oh, no, sorry. I, meant, I said spinning, not swimming. But yes to swimming. Right. Too. <laughs> I, I know. I, I know. I got that. I'm just adding on to it. If, oh, if, yeah. If you can swim, um, you know, you got the bike, you got the run. You, you know, hey, anyway, yeah. Iron Man may be in your future, and I recommend <laughs> it. But having said that, um, spinning has a different threshold your thresholds are different. I can show you uh, another, um, let me see if I can find it. Whoops, here, let me find it. Um, spinning has different thresholds from your, your running. Uh, we're talking about spinning on a trainer, you know, on a bike. And oh, where is it? I'm not finding it. Oh, here we go, here it is. Um, let me share my screen and I'll show you something. I've showed this before, but maybe not in the same way. Uh, here we go, share screen and here we go. You can probably see these two little things right here that says lactate acid test. Yep. You see that? Yep. Okay. Um, you'll note this line right here goes straight up right away. You see, it is just this line right here is lactic acid output. This line above is heart rate. 
the bottom line is lactic acid output. And you'll note it goes up right away from, I should probably zoom in on that a little better. Um, whoops. Oh, uh, where are we here? Um, slideshow. There we go. That's a little bigger. Um, so good. You'll note that this, can you see this now a little bigger? Yes. Good. Uh, you'll note this line right here, the bottom line that's defining lactic acid output. This is this line is basically defining stress, the stress on your body. The, the amount of waste product you are generating is basically stress levels, defining stress levels of your body. Now look at this. At 105 heart rate, well, let's call it 117 heart rate, just to start with. 117 heart rate, you're at 3.63 millimeters of lactate per minute, right? 3.63. Now, take that down three beats per minute, which is like nothing, and go to this graph over here. 114 beats per minute, keep in mind this is 117, you're only at 1.53 on this graph. This is lactic acid on the bottom line, heart rate on the top line. Now, I'll explain where this is all headed in a minute, but note the huge difference, 1.53 versus 3.6. You're talking half the stress levels, essentially, on this graph versus this graph. Got it? Got it. So right here at 138 beats per minute to two with 2.13 millimeters of lactate, this, this graph is basically going anaerobic. Okay, that's kind of where your threshold is where you're way above marathon race pace. Marathon race pace would be kind of like in here somewhere in this area. I have another graph that shows this more specifically. But so anaerobic, you're at 2.13 milliliters of lactate is your stress level, 138 beats per minute. This one, it's just off and running. It's, you know, probably the equivalent here is 129. Here's 140. So you're looking at 138 beats per minute, 140 beats per minute. You're way anaerobic. Look at this. You're at 8.77 milliliters of lactate, where here you're only at 2.13. Now, what the hell are we looking at? I mean, this one stays down like for a long time. This one goes up right away. We're talking about stress levels. This graph was made by a beginner. Now, I'll explain that even more in a minute. This was an obvious graph of an advanced person, right? Because you got this base you, that it's not really going up in stress very much. Even though your heart rate is consistently going up, your stress levels are pretty much staying low, right? So this is advanced, the one on the right. The one on the left is a beginner. Now here's the difference. This answers your question. The one on the left was done a day before the one on the right. Hmm. Both were done by the same person. Got it? Got the it. difference is, and this is the real answer to your question, the one on the left was done on a stationary bike on, uh, you know, spinning on a cycle on a trainer, right? A bicycle on a trainer. This one was done by a runner on a treadmill, same person one day apart. Huge difference. Right. This is a beginner cyclist. This is a, an advanced runner, one day apart, same person. Got the picture? Yeah. <laughs> um, so can you use your cycling to build your running? Yeah, sort of. I mean, there are some elements that make it work. You know, you're using slightly different muscles, um, but really you can see this, this is, this is a graph. This is as graphic as it gets. Um, you can see the difference. It's shocking. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's the same person. So wow. a day apart. So um, yeah. Anyway, that 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 kind of graphically answers with a graph. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cycling. Like I said, there's no bad in endurance sport. Everything will benefit you a little bit. And remember that graph earlier on cycling would be that general training, um, you know, but there is a value to that specific training. Like we just, you know, you just saw in those two graphs. So, Thank you. Got it. Yeah. Um, I could even argue running on a tennis court or playing soccer would give you slightly different results depending on what you're focused on. Um, soccer is all about speed work. You know, if you don't really need 200 meter, 400 meter repeats going back and forth and waiting and back and forth, and, you know, that's soccer. It's speed work that could work instead of, you know, like 200, 400 meter repeats, you know, playing a game of soccer but it will not work to build endurance. Endurance meaning low heart rate. Right. So um, yeah, you can kind of sort of mix and match, but now it's getting down to the nitty gritty. It's less general, more specific. Um, and that will only increase and, you know, change. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, Philip, hopefully, hopefully I have answered that one. Definitely. <laughs> okay, maybe too much, but no, 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 it's it's awesome. I mean, honestly, I could ask you six million questions, but I don't want to monopolize. <laughs> uh, well, let me get through a few more and feel free. I'll, I'm here until you know the sun comes up or whatever, <laughs> uh, whichever comes first. Um, Bertina, in level one, I noticed that it doesn't have the details at the end on how much we accomplished, like you showed us. Oh, um, I should tell you the schedule I showed you is the original schedules. Um, the schedules that are online are kind of like very prettied up versions of my Excel spreadsheet. You were actually looking at a PDF of my original spreadsheets. And on my original spreadsheets, I wanted to see all the algorithms and all the math. And every, you know, there were a lot of people around me that said, David, get rid of all of that because no one will know what the hell it is. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> so uh, if you want to see all the details, send me an email with your group and I'd be glad to give you my version, the ugly version of for your training group. I've broken them all down. It's not just five schedules. It's like, you know, we have 24 schedules. So if you want that ugly version with all the bells and whistles, um, you, you know, you'll, you'll see tons of stuff that I dealt with in creating these schedules. Then we'll just appreciate you more. Oh, well, I appreciate your appreciation and that comment. Thank you very much. But yes, yeah, anybody, send me an email with the, the number group that you're in, uh, you know, run, run, walk, or walk, and uh, I'll send you that group's specific detailed ugly sheet <laughs> uh, via email, and you will, you will have it all. Thank whether you. you. Whether you wanted it all or not, you can delete it. You know, I mean, it's so it's simple for me to copy and paste. So there you go. Uh, anything else? Let's see. Uh, as you guys have kind of known, um, all you need to do is scroll your cursor across the page and click on that, you know, mute button and you can talk. We will hear you. Um, I think most of you are probably muted as we, we you came into this thing. But uh, any other questions, either verbal or written? I don't see any more written in the chat. And while I, I'll take a second and thank ASICS, actually, we may be looking at that backwards, uh, uh, but I will thank ASICS and Volvo for sponsoring our LA Roadrunner program. Um, they're amazing. And in that time, I got another question from our amazing Orly. Without her, we would probably not have a lot of the things that we do like t-shirts and all sorts of stuff. So everybody, when you see Orly in Run Walk 3, Run Walk 3, um, thank her um, for everything that she does for all of us. Um, totally off topic, but what do you recommend to do so one doesn't need to go use the restroom so much in the cold? Oh, I know, isn't that? Um, I never need to go during any marathon, but both times at Big Bear, I had to go four to six times. Keep in mind, everybody, Big Bear was like, what, 30 degrees or something? Horrible. 22, 22 degrees, <laughs> 32 being freezing level. Okay. Yep. Jeez. Um, 
I had to go four to six times in the first half when it was freezing. Lost too many damn minutes to porta potties. I can totally agree with that, that one. Honestly, I don't have an answer for that. When it's that cold, we do tend to need to go to the bathroom more often. And I don't know why I've not seen any science on it. I really don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, Julie said it happened to her. And I've experienced the same kind of thing on a cold, cold day. Um, I, I remember, you know, having to go to the bathroom a bunch of times when it was like freezing out there. Um, yeah, Google, why do you pee more on a cold day? I don't know. It says it's, well, thank you for that first part of the shout out. I really appreciate it. I don't think I'm doing that much, but thank you so much. Um, but on the off topic question, it's, uh, and I've looked it up. It just says, yeah, because your the blood does something, it rushes more to your oh, uh, core to keep your core alive. It's like a, you know, it's some sense. sort of a survival thing. Right. So when your blood rushes so much more to your core, it affects all your internal organs. So then you keep having to go pee so much. And I'm like, oh my God, that was 12 precious minutes. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, is, is like it, if I, cause I'm planning to get a sub five eventually mm -hmm. one day soon. It, and I think Big Bear is my best shot, but mm. if I'm going to keep losing so many minutes in the porta potties in the first half while we're up there, like layer, rub Vaseline all over me, keep myself warm, like, oof, I well, don't know. Keeping, keeping yourself warmer would, would do the trick. I, that, it does make sense now that you talk about it, that, um, you know, when you have when you run for example you divert blood away from your stomach so if you you eat something solid you may not be able to digest it because the blood is diverted away from your stomach to muscles that you're running with in your arms and legs so mm -hmm. it would make sense you know your heart is the the um water pump of your radiator right and mm -hmm. um well, that would be a hot day. On a cold day, your heart is taking heat and pumping it out into your extremities, which would do on a hot day too, but it would get warmth to your extremities, like your fingers and your arms and your legs so you run with. So it would, would definitely divert it away from your stomach and all those internal organs that, you know, you would use to, you know, your, your, um, your bladder you know? So that okay. makes sense. I would think the answer might be just wear a coat. The problem is, is a coat is going to slow you down because it's tougher to run with. I did. I mean, like, I don't know if you saw the picture of my start. I had like two giant coats on. I had a mylar blanket around my waist and I rubbed Vaseline on my legs just to keep my legs warmer. But it wasn't really helping. Um, I'm just thinking, like, is there or is well, there, I'm thinking you know, I'm like how we with a um, hydrate, like from the Wednesday, like you keep drinking, drinking, drinking. Should I just get that hydration lower, like not to have so much water in my system from days before? Yeah, dehydration well. can become. <laughs> you know, dangerous if you become dehydrated that will slow you down right there i mean I, I remember god it's a catch-22 yeah you know i mean i i would maybe wear a coat that will keep you warm the entire race not just the beginning um that would help but it, the coat itself is heavier and it's going to slow you yeah. down there is a reality here and that's that on a really hot day like in the upper 80s or 90s you know, you're going to be slower um, just because your heart rate is going to be higher in trying to cool your body off. And on a really, really cold day, you're, you're going to be slower just because your body, your heart is working harder to keep your body warm. You know, I mean, there is a reality to weather. 
Um, right. I've always said heat, heat, hills, and headwinds, the three H's from hell. Yeah. And <laughs> part of part of that heat would also be cold, you know, and right. it, it would make sense that you would be experiencing not only what you were experiencing and having to go to the bathroom more, but also um, your heart rate is probably higher. You're probably utilizing more carbs, that limited reservoir um, in the form of glycogen. I you mean, I had more. a great race regardless of everything I, because I didn't need to go during the second half at all. I negative split it by like 16 minutes. Great. And all of that, it's just, I was like, God, why can't I just hold it? when like during the cold but I, I just couldn't it was just impossible like none of the LA marathons none of the other marathons that I've ever ran I ever needed to go like New York I didn't go like none of the other ones but this one both times like when we're up in the mountains I just every single aid station I have to stop and I don't know I'm just trying to figure this one out if I do yes. I'll get us up five yeah, yeah, it's an experience, you know, all people have, and the way you explained it, you know, it makes sense. I don't really have an answer for that one. <laughs> I, 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 I do remember talking with the race director. Um, it's a different race director now. She's been there for, God, 15 years, I'm going to say. But the previous race director, I remember saying to him, you know, you put on an amazing race. 2004, I said this to him. I said, you put on an amazing race, but it needed to be a cooler day. It got up to 94 degrees. And he said, you know, David, I, I next time I will make the phone <laughs> call to the dude upstairs. And <laughs> that yeah. was me last year. I finished at 92 degrees. We started like at 30 degrees. We ended up at 92 degrees. And I was about to like go to the hospital. It was just so damn hot. I It was ugly last year this year everything was perfect it's just the the bathrooms but yeah like it does get really ugly down in San Bernardino I only signed up on like the day before mm. I kept checking weather I was like if it's gonna be hot again I'm not gonna so oh, I now you, it so, went the other way yeah <laughs> now, now it was just like 20 degrees and I'm like come on I can't win this ouch yeah <laughs> I, I, I coached a guy once who was one of our pace leaders, and I won't say who, but he was going to go about a two hour and 45 minute marathon in Boston. He was just locked in, ready to go. It was mapped out. It was perfect. And it was like one of those 33 degree days or whatever it was. And he actually had to stop because he had to warm up, you know, do one of these to his leg kind of thing. Because his leg was freezing. I mean, freezing, you know. And yep. he, he ended up like a half hour slower. But, um, you know, I mean, he was there. His ability, everything. And, you know, it's just, there is that reality that you just can't get around with weather. Um, you know, I, I had to tell the whole pace group when I was a pace leader in 2004, that we're not going to finish within 20 to 25 minutes of our goal intended pace. I was leading group five and we passed group four, group three, group two, and even a couple people from group one. And I was leading group five and we did really well. They did really bad, but I took the weather into consideration. Um, you know, that was just 90, that was a tough year, um, you know, but y you just, I don't have an answer for that one, you know, when it's the heat okay. goes I'll up, figure something. Yeah. When I'll, the I'll heat, get my sub five somehow, somewhere. You, you will, <laughs> you will, I guarantee it somewhere you will, you will have that day. I guarantee it. But um, when the heat goes up, the pace goes down. And when the temperature goes down, the pace goes down. So, you know, there is that reality. Or I should say, you need to lower that pace or eventually you get to a point in your run where your body will shut you down. 
your subconscious mind will slow you down purposefully. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I wish I had a better answer. Um, heaters, heaters and people movers. That, that could solve the problem, but that's another story. Anyway. Uh, what the people move? <laughs> yeah, you know, 26 mile people mover. God, you'd get there in no time. Uh, I'm not serious. Uh, I don't think they're going to put rows of heaters along the course either, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, not for 26 miles. Um, more questions. Moved up pace group and running the new pace at a 140 heart rate, 150 plus uphill. Okay, wattage average around 250 watts. Uh, I'd be curious to know what kind of watch you're using that's gauging the wattage because different, um, you know, like Polar has different ratioed scale than Garmin has a different ratioed scale than Koros. You know, they all like, like Cellulus and Fahrenheit are different ratioed scales, but 32 degrees is freezing and zero degrees is freezing but they're totally different numbers. So I, I'd be curious to know which watch you're using. Um, 250 watts is great. Sounds amazing, depending on the watch you have. Um, uh, got it. Should I pay attention to this metric? Does it matter or is it just fun to know your wattage? Watts are great. I mean, if you've ever done cycling, you know, cyclists swear by watts, wattage. Basically, what we're talking about is energy output. For those of you who don't understand what we're talking about, watt wattage is um, new watches like the one I'm wearing from Koros. Um, but um, uh, you can get uh, uh, the same way you get pace, distance, you get a little screen that says watts or, you know, a number with W. And watts are basically your energy output, the, the amount of force that you're using. So when you're running up a hill, you want the same wattage as running up a hill as being on flat or going downhill, right? So if you're going up a hill, your heart rate could be higher and then, then it would be on flat, but your watts, you want to stay the same, right? You want your wattage to stay the same. You want your, the, the energy output you use to stay the same on all your hills throughout your whole marathon. And while your heart rate's going up and up and up and up and up on your marathon, um, because of dehydration and fatigue, your wattage you want basically to stay the same. Um, unless you're doing like, you got a negative split thing going, which would be very good with the LA Marathon because there are so many hills early on in the LA Marathon. So your second half really easily, you want it faster than the first half because your first half you want slower because of the hills, but you kind of want your wattage to stay the same, the first half, three quarter, and then you can up your wattage even a little more toward the end and speed a little more toward the end of the marathon. But watts are a great tool. Um, you know, I know cyclists don't look at miles per hour. You know, they look at heart rate and wattage. You know, how many watts am I am I kicking out? And 250 watts on a bike would, would be, you know, pretty darn good. I'm not going to hit that high watts on a bike. But uh, anyway, um, it, it'd be, I'd have to know what watch you're using. And I'm not even sure what the, it's so new to things like Garmin. Um, Apple Ultra just came out, all the Apple Watches, the new upgrade, just came out with watts built into it. So it sounds like, because Apple's doing it, you know, the high-end Garmin watches, the high-end Polar watches have watts. So it's kind of a new metric. Um, this is actually a low-end Koros watch, and it has wattage, um, but um, that seems like the new thing that's going to be hitting the market now that Apple has it. Um, you know, watch for a, a, a lot of Garmin level watches have watts um, <clears throat> along with uh, what is it? The, the Garmin Phoenix 7 and the, the what is it? The, the Edge or whatever, the Garmin high-end watches. Anyway, I have it now. Um, so yeah, take, take a look at your heart rate. Take a look at your watts. 
Um, make sure you're not going too high. You know, see what it is on flat ground. See how you feel. Are you really comfortable? Where is that easy pace? What's your wattage on easy pace? Um, I, I think the future I would love to give, and I do know some coaches, especially triathletes and cyclists, um, give their workouts based on watts. You know, uh, five minutes at 110 watts, and then uh, eight minutes at 300 watts off uh, five minutes at at 90 watts, you know, off 300 watts at eight minutes again. You know, that would be a great workout. That would be a high intensity interval workout, um, you know, with, with running, with using watts. <clears throat> so there are a lot of different ways you can use it. And it's a great, great tool. Hopefully I, I asked, answered that. Philip, yeah, ultra, the, the yes, yes. ultra, sorry. No, yeah. and, 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 and that's a great answer. Uh, uh, the, the first part of the question is the one that, that, you know, the, the heart rate and the new pace group, you know, moving up from nine to, to five, uh, in groups. And then, <clears throat> you know, the, the heart rate being at 140 in the new group. I mean, is that in the zone? I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not overdoing it or. It depends on the size of your heart. And I mean that. <laughs> um, that sounds like a weird answer. Um, 140 heart rate for me would be anaerobic. That's me. Um, I tend to have very low heart rate. Um, yeah, my heart rate right now is like 86 or something like that. And I'm still talking and moving. I'm not, you know, but I tend to have, you know, 85 let's see, what is it? 65 to 80 beats per minute is at rest heart rate where you've been like asleep for a long period of time, or you've been immobilized for a long period of time. 65 to eight, 60 to 85 beats per minute is at rest, usually average human being. I'm at rest, you know, at like 45, 50, you know, so everybody's very different. Um, I just happen to have all my, my thresholds are just really low heart rate. So 140 to me, would be through the roof, let alone 150. But for a lot of people, you know, and it has nothing to do with age. I know we have these age calculations. What is it like 220 minus your age? And that's where you're at lactate threshold or some crazy thing. I, I don't know what it is, but I, I, there's no relevance that I can see to that calculation that's why I don't even know what it is because it's just meaningless to me. But so there's no real way to calculate this very easily. Um, you'd really just have to go by feel. Okay. If, if you're feeling, I mean, yeah, you could do a blood lab take test for like $200 or, or do um, you, you could do a time trial and look at your V dot, you know, that V dot app. It, it, it's not perfect. It's really kind of a hit and miss sort of, but somehow, you know, just feeling it out, if you feel really comfortable, if you're talking really comfortably, like I am now, not having to take a breath like I'm doing now just to keep talking and doing this kind of thing, um, that's maybe a little above where you want to be at easy pace. Th that might be more marathon race pace, but you, you'd want to lower your heart rate maybe a little lower if that's where you're at at 140, 150. Um, and you're supposed to be at easy pace. Um, so see, kind of feel it out. Um, you'll see. Um, in terms of the group that you're in, if you're burning out, you know, you got about 80, 90 minute window of glycogen. And if you're burning out after about, say, give it 10 minutes for your heart rate to get up there, you know. So figure if you're burning out after about 100 minutes, so 10 minutes beyond an hour and a half, you're not an easy pace. You're just burning up glycogen. You're depleting glycogen very quickly. You're not even at marathon race pace. You're, you know, more like threshold, lactate threshold pace. Actually, that's where you would be. You would be at lactate threshold pace. So um, you'd just be depleting glycogen where you want to maintain glycogen um, by replenishing glycogen, you know, from your, your blood sugar turns into glycogen. So, you know, you've eaten breakfast and dinner the night before, you've got a lot of stored blood sugar, blood glucose. 
and you, that turns into glycogen. So you don't need to be depleting your glycogen levels until your heart rate gets really, really high after de dehydration and fatigue set in. And even on a long run, that's why we really want to make sure we're really, really at easy pace because our heart rate is going to go up and up and up and up and up on those longer, longer runs. And if we start at marathon race pace and go up and up and up and up, you're not going to be building endurance, that fat burning engine. You're going to be utilizing glycogen and depleting glycogen. And you're going to finish your runs, not building endurance, but just beating yourself up for no reason. F feeling at the end of the run, like, oh, thank God that run is over. I don't think I could have continued on. Whether if you were really at low heart rate, easy pace, it would have been, okay, now what? Right. 20 mile run? Yeah, okay. You know, you don't really need to take in carbohydrate. Now, I, I preface that by saying run walkers and walkers especially are slightly different in that run walkers do do their workout effort with a range where marathon race pace is in the middle. So run walkers are a little different and walkers do it even different where their, their marathon race pace is slower than their training paces tend to be faster. Got it? So um, walkers may need to take in gels and carbohydrate. Well, they do. And walkers definitely need to take in gels or some form of carbohydrate where runners may get away with taking in nothing for that very reason, because their, their training regimen, their, their range of pace is a little higher heart rate for walkers, a little less for run walkers, and even less for runners, if that makes sense. So, but yeah, yeah. you definitely want to make sure you're easy pace as a runner. And that means just really low heart rate, really low wattage for whatever that means for you. You know, 250 watts, like that, I say, for me, um, on this watch, I think I was doing 110 watts the other day. So, um, but I don't know what watch you have. So, um, and no, I, I, have a, I, have an, I have an Apple Ultra watch. I mean, maybe it's because I'm, oh, I, you know, maybe it's because I'm, 100 and you know 90 pounds um, <laughs> um <laughs> i know like i said all those watches have different ratioed scales yeah just like cellulose um cellulose and fahrenheit totally different numbers you know 80 degrees fahrenheit can be like what is it 20 degrees celsius or whatever it is i don't know that they're totally different numbers it's the same thing with with the watches and wattage they don't have a universal wattage number. I, it's just yeah. a thing. <laughs> um, they do use slightly different algorithms to calculate the same thing. Um, but even still, um, I can even honestly say you're not really getting true power output, true wattage. The only thing that gets true, you know, you get this mathematical algorithms that give you a, a wattage number based on pace and distance and elevation and all these other little things like heat and whatever, um, barometric pressure, elevation. But, um, but um, you, the, the only true one that calculates pressure and wattage would be the stride foot pod. There's a company, S-T-R-Y-D, that owns the patent for wattage for a foot pod. Um, and Stride, which I do not own, and I'm not even recommending it, you kind of get a decent sense of wattage from all these watches with their algorithms. But Stride foot pod is the only true wattage power output, you know, number. Um, the rest are all, you know, these algorithms. So that kind of calculated, approximated. So yeah. anyway, they I work. mean, I, I, I guess my, my whole thing is like, am I, I feel comfortable, like even, you know, I'm, I felt fine. It felt like the pace is okay. I, I guess I've never done more than 15 miles. So I don't know what those obscure miles are in my future. And I want to make sure that I'm not running at a pace that's too quick that I'll end up 
bonking or whatever. You know what I mean? So I'm just trying to figure it out. Like my resting heart rate's in the 40s, but when I run, no matter what, at the lowest, lowest, lowest is like a buck 28, you know, like a 128 at like a really like an 11 minute mile or whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, at around 950, 10 minute miles, I'm, I'm at 140, no matter what. Yeah, so your anaerobic threshold could be higher, you know, than, than your aerobic threshold. You know, um, if you've done, have, have, in your history, have you done more like fast runs and stuff than you did slow? Just my, yeah, my athletic history was all, you know, I was a, the hockey players so it was all a lot of oh, there you go yeah kind of like of soccer you go really really fast your yeah. heart rate's really elevated yeah. so yeah you you probably have a very high anaerobic threshold so and, and your aerobic threshold may be maybe shorter i can i can show you another graph if you want to see another graph you're going to get sick of graphs you guys uh let me find it first um whoops here we go uh, let me find it. Here we go. There it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me find, show you my graph. Here we go. I'll share my screen. And where are we? Here we go. There you go. So you're probably seeing that graph. Let me see if I can't. Uh, here. There we go. I'm expanding this graph. Now, um, if I click on this, you'll know here's your aerobic zone, here's your lactate threshold zone, here's your AC, here's aerobic conditioning, I won't even bother explaining that, and here's your anaerobic zone. Now you'll know AT, anaerobic threshold, where you're really, you know, going like 5k, 10k pace, you're really breathing hard, you know, you're chasing that hockey puck right down the rink as hard as you possibly can. There's your anaerobic threshold. You'll note that on this person, it's really narrow, but on this person, the aerobic zone is really big. You know, you're talking about 15 beats per minute. Here, you're looking at, what is that, like five beats per minute increase, something like that? 145 is below it, 155 is above it. That's only about five beats. So yours is probably much bigger anaerobic threshold and your aerobic threshold is probably smaller just because of your history. You know, those who train at high heart rate, like soccer players, sprinters, you know, those kind of people have a much bigger anaerobic threshold and a much smaller aerobic threshold. So obviously you're now doing endurance work. You're doing 26 miles. Um, um, you're not doing these intervals of racing across the ice and then stopping and racing back across the ice like a soccer player. Um, so you need to build with low heart rate. So really make sure you focus on that low heart rate zone, um, <laughs> you know, because it sounds like you kind of got the AT zone, anaerobic threshold. Um, you're only going to make that better with the midweek, you know, 20% high heart rate work you know, um, but really for you, especially that's the area you need to work on. Um, if I were to create a schedule just for you alone, I would probably give you like three weeks early season right off the bat. Keep in mind, we're already well beyond the first three weeks of season. And it's not that big a deal, but I would give you nothing but aerobic work the first three weeks of training season. Um, right. nothing else just volume easy pace and then cut back and then start building with speed and easy pace you know um, so maybe it wasn't a smart idea to go up you know, <laughs> well yeah no you know you you've 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 had this small aerobic base and now you've gone through what is it we've gone nine eight almost eight and a half weeks of training we're in a, to our ninth week You've done 80% of your work is aerobic. So maybe you have built up that aerobic base. So if you are feeling comfortable, you know, maybe it was time to move up because you had a big room for growth. You know, you're, you're like at zero and you just, you know, eight weeks, you've probably grown an aerobic base that you'd never had before. 
Is that possible? I, I, I yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll feel it. Um, you, you could do like a, a VO2 max test with a mask over your mouth, testing oxygen levels, or this is what you're looking at as a blood lactate test. But there's no real reason for that. If you're feeling comfortable, you're feeling comfortable. If you're talking fluidly like I am now. Um, I remember a very fast runner um, I worked with for years. And one day I heard like a siren in a car. And a, I said, we'd been talking for like 20 minutes. And I said, where are you? He said, I'm just running down the street. I said, you're running. He said, yeah, I've been running the whole conversation. I said, you know, I had no clue. And this is a person I knew for, for years. I had no idea that he was running. He was at that comfortable pace. And he was going like 8.30 pace. Wow. But that was comfortable for him. And I had no idea, you know. Um, you'll feel it. You'll know it, you know. Yep. Okay. Um, and there is, you know, huge room for your growth as an endurance athlete. You, you may not get faster on the shorter distances because of your experience, although you probably will a little bit, but your big room for growth is down here at that aerobic zone. Um, endurance, you know, you're going to do a marathon, darn it. <laughs> and so you're, you may, because of your, your, volume of new experience at low heart rate, you may have gone to a faster level of easy pace, hence a faster group. There's no good or bad here that I don't want to, oh, you, you went to a better group. No, it's no, there's no good or bad, um, but faster, sure. If you want to do a faster marathon, um, and you're at that ability level where you're truly building endurance at that easy pace, um, and it happens to be faster, all the better, you know, all the better. Uh, so there we go. Uh, anything else? Oh, I see. Ultra is the watch you have. I hear great things about the Apple Ultra. Um, I watched a bunch of uh, lectures. It looks amazing. The big complaint is, is the battery. Um, but it's still, it's got enough battery, you know, it's 11, what is it, 14 hours of, of GPS battery life, something like that. Um, on the other hand, I might point out the watch, the, the watch I'm wearing has like 40 hours of GPS battery life, you know, but it's another story. Um, that's the complaint about the Ultra. Uh, any other questions, anybody? I'm excited to see what they do with the Apple Ultra in the future. And I think they will kind of command at least an, an interest in Watts in, in terms of, you know, training, which we've never had before, which is exciting to me. But anyway, anything else, anybody verbally or, or in print on our chat, little chat box? In that case, I am going to turn off my recording. And for all of you at home um, watching this playback, thank you for watching the playback. Um, for those of you live, hang on, I'll, I'll stay on for a little bit longer. But uh, for everybody, thank you for watching this recording and good night.